Hello out there. <laughs> Should we add a guest now or later? Later. Okay. Okay. Hello everyone. Welcome to Earthshare episode one. My name is Paloma Avila and I'm the program manager at Arlington Garden in Pasadena. Welcome. Um, so I've been working for Arlington Garden for about a year and a half now. And this is a partnership between Arlington Garden and Nature for All. I've been lucky enough to have joined Nature for All's cohort number 17 for their Leadership Academy, in which I got to take a lot of classes in organizing, advocacy, and the culmination of all the classes is we get to come up with a project. And originally I intended this project, which is called Earthshare, to be a full day event that would be held at Arlington Garden. Uh, it was to be held in June of this year. And we were going to invite lots of organizations who are doing a lot of great work in our area to come and talk about what they're working on, who they're involved with, who they're partnering. Um, but of course, we are not able to invite everyone to the garden and have these discussions. So after a lot of brainstorming, uh, we decided to have them online through Instagram where we can invite some people in to share with us their experiences, the organizations they are working with, uh, and a little bit about themselves and their connection to nature. Um, so this is the learning naturalist, Levi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, I am a teacher at a K-8 school, um, a learning naturalist, and I also do the education part at Arlington Garden. So I do things like field trips, which we're not having right now. <laughs> so what we, what we are gonna do is have these um, dining room chats. You'll notice we're not at Arlington Garden. Um, to be at Arlington Garden while it does stay open for the public during this time, uh, we do ask that you wear a mask and it is in fact required that you wear a mask while you're at the garden. So we decided rather than doing the video at Arlington Garden behind our masks, <laughs> uh, we would just stay home and do these videos with you. Um, the idea of these videos is to have an intimate conversation uh, with people about how they are personally involved with the work that they do. So in talking with people who represent partner organizations and other local people who are working to care for the earth, um, partners with Arlington Garden, uh, as well as the larger community. Um, so our first guest on our series is uh, Michelle Matthews, who is the director at Arlington Garden. Um, and I'm going to invite her to join us now. And one thing we were thinking of when we were changing our individuals is to get that story um, from each person. Hello, Michelle. Uh, to really get to hear their individual stories. And also, usually people aren't just part of one organization and it's myopic. They're part of a whole community who are all working together and we wanted to get that story as well now that we're able to have this one-on-one -on -one chat. Welcome Michelle. Thank you Hi, Michelle. and Levi. Hi, nice to see you guys. Good to see, nice to see you. you. Michelle, can you um, just briefly introduce yourself and also tell us more about Arlington Garden? So um, I am the executive director of Arlington Garden, and we are a two and a half acre climate appropriate garden. Can you hear me okay? Is that everything? Okay, good. Yep, we're good over here. All right. Um, so yeah, we're a two and a half acre climate appropriate garden in Pasadena. Typically people say they drive by us all the time and don't know that we're a public free garden. So our first question for you, Michelle, mm -hmm. um, what does nature mean to you? So this, this is a, bit, a question that I've been working on for a long time. Um, to me, I guess I finally realized that nature is everywhere. Um, 
I thought I had to escape LA in order to find nature. Like when I moved to the Midwest, uh, because I thought Chicago had more nature, but they actually just had more rain and cold. <laughs> um, but it took like leaving LA in order for me to discover that, that nature is here and nature is where you stand and nature is everywhere. Um, it's just been covered up or built up, built over or, or blown up or destroyed. And now it's our job to help it regenerate, be renewed and be restored and realize that we are part of nature and not separate from it. Um, can you describe your first experiences or memories of nature? So, um, yes, I was born, I was born in Iran and there are photos of us camping in the Caspian Sea. So I don't really have memories of that, but I saw the photos and um, it was kind of an interesting experience to, to look at those photos and see, you know, us going out camping in the Caspian Sea, which I think people don't realize that, the, that Iran is also Mediterranean and it's a Mediterranean climate and there are different, like Libya is also, I think, a Mediterranean climate. So there's different Mediterranean climates that have been somewhat neglected in terms of when you talk about what a Mediterranean climate is. But anyways, um, what I clearly remember more is, is playing in an empty lot. We moved to San Diego when I was like three and there was an empty lot in the back and I befriended a bobcat. I think I'm pretty sure it was a bobcat because it had a, a stubby tail and it was beautiful. And I had a deep love for animals and I was very sensitive to the environment. Um, and then we moved to LA and then I remember the El Nino rains, um, summer day trips to Manhattan and Hermosa Beach and Redondo Beach, salty ocean water, swimming at public parks like in Marina del Rey, um, the smell of chlorine. My dad would take me for long bikes, uh, bike rides in Venice. And I was really sad when I couldn't fit on the little seat that was on the back of the bike. Um, and then I remember climbing down into the LA River and the concrete basin because we lived in Mar Vista and being scared because I thought we shouldn't be there. And I thought my dad was crazy for taking us down there. Um, I remember going back and forth between Hawthorne and University High School. And we had at, at the high school, we had a beautiful freshwater spring now called uh, Kurovunga. Um, and then I would go to my friend's homes who had gorgeous gardens in the hills of Bel Air and Dana Point. Um, so I remember a lot of like sitting in traffic, sitting in buses and the smell of the Santana winds, um, the Northridge earthquake. Um, so those are my earliest memories of, of nature. And if you asked me this before, like I think I wouldn't have described that as experiencing nature because I thought that was just experiencing LA. But now I re to me, it was experiencing nature even the smell of chlorine. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I like how your experiences include a lot of senses of smell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very informative. <laughs> um, so let's move to the present and talk a little about what you're working on now and your experiences in nature. The work that I'm doing now is I'm the executive director of Arlington Garden, and we're working on transforming the urban landscape with healthy gardens that combat climate change and connect people. One of my favorite things to do is to go to the garden and experience the garden and be in the garden. I live in an, in an apartment in downtown Pasadena. I don't have a yard. I don't have a garden. So going to the garden has been a really wonderful thing for me in order to be able to enjoy, you know, the feeling that I have there, the peace that I have there, walking around, seeing the, the, the bloom, seeing all the wildflowers. Um, so it's, it's been a really wonderful experience. 
Just out of curiosity, do you think a lot of people who visit think that they're taking themselves out of the city and into nature when they're at the garden? Or do you think they see it as this entire ecosystem that we're a part of? I mean, I definitely think that it's a special place. It's a, it's a unique place. We've, we've done a lot of hard work to turn it from an empty lot that was denuded for over 45 years into the thriving habitat that it is. So it is a very natural feeling experience that you don't necessarily have to like drive, you know, hours to get to or go off to some kind of like remote hike in order to get there. Um, so I imagine that for a lot of people that it is an experience of this idea of precious nature. It's this idea of experience that, oh, I'm somewhere else and I'm not in the city. It feels, it certainly feels like an urban forest to me. Awesome. Um, how did you come to Arlington and become involved with this kind of work? So I uh, have mo mostly been a professional designer for many nonprofit organizations. Um, I worked at the ACLU, I worked at MOCA, and for like 20 other nonprofit organizations doing freelance work. I studied history and fine art uh, as an undergrad at SMC, UCLA, the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, and grad school at USC. Um, I studied photography, and my photography was largely about the built environment and my identity and, our, and my relationship to the built environment. So most of my photography was about empty lots, spaces of transformation, um, spaces of construction, spaces of destruction, and also like unhealthy landscapes. I first met Betty and Charles in 2008, and uh, the Boy Scouts were working on the dry river, river Arroyo bed along Arlington Drive. So I ended up quitting my job at MOCA uh, as a senior designer to work with La Loma, the construction company, uh, the contractor who did the dry stacked broken concrete walls and the berms and swales that slow sink and spread the water. Uh, at one point I started a nonprofit called Zanha Madre in 2010 uh, and then went back to work for another nonprofit uh, Sundance Institute as a senior designer in 2015. So Betty contacted me in 2016 when she found out that she had cancer and I was hired as the first non-founding executive director in uh, July of 2017. So, so yeah, so that's how I, I came to be at Arlington. Um. I want to talk a little bit about the the community as you see it that you work in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to ask you how, first describe the community that you work in and then talk about how you serve that community. And also how does that community support the work that you do? Uh, so I think that we are, are, we are incredibly blessed and grateful to have such a supportive and involved community and our board of directors, volunteers, and staff are very engaged. Our oldest board member is 90 years old, and he was the former city manager of Pasadena. Um, to me, the, the story of Arlington is so unique because it is a community-built botanical garden. I think that a lot of gardens are different because they're often kind of treated as, you know, parcels of land that, you know, you own some part of it and then you farm that part or they're edible. But I think Arlington is really unique because it is an integrated free community garden. It's on state owned Caltrans land and is a really unique result of a strong relationship between the city of Pasadena and the community. So one of the things that I've said is that instead of a freeway, we built a garden. Um, and that is because of the hundreds of people who helped build the garden and a larger community that helped 
to advocate against the freeway. So this is a long journey that we're on. And so this, you know, I think the freeway w was supposed to be started in 1965. Um, and it's been, and so now I think that this is like the second phase of, okay, so now that we're not gonna do the freeway, what's gonna happen next? So I think we support the community by providing free open space, um, especially for folks that don't have private access to a mm -hmm. or yard. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of parks in the city, but you don't find a lot of people at parks the way that you do at Arlington because it's so beautiful and people enjoy going there and it feels good to be there. So we also serve as a demonstration for what is possible. And our other, com our community is also our, um, I want to, I don't know, animal community. So we, we support we support a large ecological community and, and habitat in the garden. If you go there, one of the things that you love about it is that there, there are so many birds and butterflies and bees and insects. Um, so that's exciting and, and also one of the reasons why it's so nice to be in the garden. Yeah, something you mentioned um, struck with me and it's something that we talk about a lot and that's how um, parceling and owning property, uh, you see it a lot in community gardens, um, but you see it in how we are structured in our neighborhoods too, how separated we are from each other, how blocked off. And something I noticed at Arlington is there's hardly, if any, uh, squares, sections blocked off, there's no fencing, everything flows into each other and it's very inviting. And I know that was intentional by the design. Um, I don't know if you wanna talk a little about how you wanna keep the garden open and inviting to everyone. Absolutely. I think one of the worst things to do would be to put a fence around the garden. I, I think that it's incredibly important that we take care of and protect free open space by keeping it free and open. The majority of people who come to Arlington take care of it. The majority of people who come to Arlington love it. And I, I, I feel like that's really important to focus on and remember. We have had, you know, some vandalism. We do get damage, we get things stolen. You know, having a public space has its own kind, kinds of difficulties and problems, but it's, I think it's incredibly important to culture that we have spaces of community and community building and free spaces, places that don't cost anything um, that you can go and enjoy and you don't have to pay money to be there. I think it's a cornerstone of democracy um, and, and, and every community should have an Arlington garden and don't put a fence around it because putting a fence around it means it, 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 it signifies so many problems of, I don't trust you and you can't take care of it. It's just, it's a division and it's unnecessary. Nice. Um, so big question, what is uh, your hope or vision for the future? And I'm gonna also open up to questions now from the audience. So I have a lot of hopes and I have a, lot, I have a big vision. <laughs> um, I hope that Arlington can continue to be a pivotal place uh, for the regeneration of over the 558 properties along a five mile corridor into the urban fabric. There's a real opportunity, I think, to improve the quality of life for many people who live along this corridor um, and do some transformative urban healing. So like improved walkability, safety, uh, more native street trees, a healthier urban tree canopy, slowing traffic down along Pasadena Avenue, um, perhaps doing something similar like what was done in, in New York with the High Line or other major cities that have either stopped the development of freeways or transformed freeways into more walkable space. So, or, o overall, I think we need to prioritize planning for people and not for cars. So with the pandemic, I feel like we are seeing 
how we could all benefit from staying home, walking more, having better public infrastructure, having more climate appropriate open space, uh, less pollution, less driving, more locally grown food. So in the, a lot of people don't know that in the early 1900s, uh, Los Angeles County was one of the top ab agricultural producers in the county, or the country, sorry. So currently in the nation, lawn is our number one agriculture. We use one third of our water on watering lawn. And this is not healthy. So my hope and vision for the future is that we have less lawn and that we have a relationship to the land like we do to our body. So if you have, you know, you're into this idea of like self care and I take care of my body, like let's look at the land like it's a part or an extension of our body. So without the body, there is no mind. And without the mind, there is no body. Without the land and the soil, there is no us. So I hope we can renew our relationship to the land and realize how we are all connected. And, and I think right now with the, I guess, incompetence of the current administration and the dismantling of the federal, federal government, um, I think that we must make an impact locally. So it's about looking at where you are at and where you are standing and what difference that you can make and where you can do the work or you can support the work of others that are growing food or, um, you know, find the people that are doing the work that you can support. So support the growers, the small nurseries and the earth workers. Mm, I think I think that, you know, given this current situation, we are really, we are going to continue to have more climate incidents, like the 118 heat degree that we, um, heat, the heat incident, I'm sorry, heat incident that we had a couple of years ago at the garden. And the garden was quite resilient and it did really well considering. Um, but we have to look, invest in local climate appropriate gardens and as Vanda Shiva has said, gardens of diversity. So if you look at Arlington, it's very diverse, both by the people who visit and the wildlife habitat that our gardens have fostered. And I think if you compare that to, you know, a lawn, or if you compare that to asphalt or a parking lot, you see the, you actually see the success and you see what a difference climate appropriate landscapes make in terms of our overall health and happiness. Um, but not only for us, but for, you know, beneficial insects, birds, pollinators and whatnot. So I just feel that we have to do the work to repair the deep social inequalities and cultural vision divisions and environmental degradation. Um, there is an opportunity, despite what is happening on a national level, to rebuild and renew and recharge. Um, and, and at Arlington, I hope that we can use our power and our privilege to make a difference uh, in Pasadena. And it will just have a domino effect, I hope. Um, so I just want to reiterate for anybody who's watching um we are encouraging questions um so that we can have an interactive experience we would love to hear if you have any questions for michelle questions about arlington garden um anything you have so we're scrolling through right now and seeing if we have any questions uh can we still buy that marmalade <laughs> during important. the quarantine <laughs> Michelle, can we still buy the marmalade? Yes. Do you want to talk about the marmalade? We haven't we talked talk about, about that. The marmalade. <laughs> so um, we have about 40 Washington naval orange trees. And every year we harvest the oranges and make marmalade with Ewaldo Ward, which is a local family 
owned and operated cannery in Sierra Madre that's been there for like a hundred years. So, you know, all, for all of the gar gardening techniques, techniques at Arlington, we don't use weed killer. We don't use chemicals. We don't use powered lawn and mow and, and bow, blow equipment. Um, so the marmalade for the most part is organic. It's just not certified. Um, currently, you can buy it at Jones Coffee um, on Arroyo Parkway. They have a little drive through. Um, you can also, we were, we were selling the marmalade um, on Tuesdays when we had our volunteer Tuesdays. But since the quarantine, we haven't had volunteer Tuesdays and we've been quarantine, quarantined. Um, but we are still, ha we still have it in the garden and ho we hope that when we can reopen um, or have mar our volunteer Tuesdays that, that you'll be able to buy it in the garden. But for now you can get it at Jones Coffee and I think Armstrong Garden in Pasadena. Um, just to clarify, so the garden is still open. Yes. For the public. Uh, we're asking that people wear masks. Uh, with the exception of uh, Tuesdays where the garden is closed. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so that was difficult. I mean, we we felt that for the safety and protection of our staff that we would close the garden on Tuesday. But how do you close a garden that it doesn't have a fence. So, so we hope that people respect the fact that the garden is closed um, just for the safety of our staff. It makes it easier for them to do the work that they need. Um, and we do have a very small gardening staff, I think for our garden, uh, an appropriate, uh, an appropriate uh, gardening staff would be at least one to two full-time people. And we have like, I'm the only full-time person right now. So it's, it's, we do a lot with very little. All right. Um, one of the questions was, which lot on Pasadena Avenue do you dream for? I mean, I dream for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I dream for possibly one of the other adjacent properties next to Cal to the garden that's that is empty and unoccupied and owned by Caltrans for a creative urban design and ecology library. So that's kind of a bigger picture idea that we are thinking about. And, and more, um, another... with other oh, sorry. more partnerships with other gardens and, and, and working together. Yes. Yeah, something would be that would be nice uh, for the future is, you know, partnership with the city of Pasadena to help with their parkways. Right now it's filled with a lot of dying, diseased pear trees, which are not native. Uh, and, you know, it's a stark contrast between that and Arlington, which is absolutely thriving right now. Agreed. <laughs> sure. Another question we had, um, what can we do as a city or individuals to help people have access uh, and access. equity access and equity in term access to the garden or I think maybe in terms of access to nature or access to amenities I mean I think it's more it's going to be about building more gardens and growing more climate appropriate gardens in places where there are none. Like my parents still live in Hawthorne and I don't, you know, we don't have an Arlington garden there and I would love for them to have that. I feel like, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for workforce development for job training for helping people to learn new skills and grow more food and and have like these gardens of diversity and beauty so um from lot to spot is an organization that is transforming empty lots into gardens and working with community 
members, I think it's important to when, you know, doing this kind of work that you look for existing organizations and partner with them and support them and help them do the work. Or if they're not there, that you work with local community members, um, getting, you know, it's park, Parks and Rec is one of these things that is to a certain degree a luxury. And I, I feel like we'll see what, what happens, but it's a luxury, but it's also a necessity and it helps to improve, you know, health and safety and wellness. So I think it's, it's a necessity that, that these parks and gardens are, are built and supported all throughout LA County, not just in Pasadena. So. All right. Um, next question. What type of beneficial insect have you seen at the garden that you haven't seen elsewhere? Oh. <laughs> I don't. I think. Do you? For me, it's the fact that you can see all these different types of insects on the same plant together. You see a bumblebee, a carpenter bee, hoverflies, honeybees, dragonflies, they're all right there, right next to each other. And that's pretty amazing. And it shows the biodiversity of the garden. Agreed, yes. And I think, um, I just love looking around, seeing all of, all of uh, the life that is thriving. And it's, it's quite, it feels lovely and wonderful. So I, I can't answer that from a technical perspective, but I can answer it from a visceral perspective. <laughs> I would encourage uh, anyone with that question, um, take a look. The biodiversity in that garden is, is impressive for, uh, especially for a garden that is surrounded by pavement. Um, it, it's, as Paloma was saying, if you just wander through the wildflowers, um, you won't just see European honeybees. You'll see, I would guess, four or five kinds of bees alone, um, mm -hmm. just at a glance. So if you're interested in that, um, go out and take a look for yourself and see what you find. Um, what is your favorite part of the garden and why? Uh, I think it would be a combination between the Olive LA and then the California Native Wildflower Walk. So having a garden with that kind of contrast, I feel like is a nice way to experience a garden in terms of the order of the Olive LA and then the kind of like wildness of the Wildflower Walk. Um, someone mentioned that they love the wishing tree. Um, do you want to talk a little about that and maybe some of your favorite wishes if you've happened upon them or if you've ever put a wish in the wishing tree? So uh, I don't think I've ever put a wish in the wishing tree yet, but <laughs> uh, the wishing trees were donated by the Yoko Ono I don't know if there, it's the Wish Tree Foundation, but it's been about 10 years or 11. And they're the original crepe myrtle trees that were um, put at the, I think it was the one Colorado in partnership with um, the Armory. So she came and then, and people wrote their wishes and then the trees that were used were donated to Arlington. So, so we take the wishes and we bury them. Um, they are supposed to be sent to Iceland, but we haven't sent them to Iceland recently. <laughs> but we do bury them in the garden. Can you think of a wish that you've seen that stood out to you? Um, It's okay. <laughs> I can't think of one either, even though I know I've seen a number of them. <laughs> um, um, someone had a question about the compost hub. 
Do you oh, want yeah. to talk about what the Compost Hub is? And then uh, their question was whether it's open right now. Uh, I believe the Compost Hub is open. It is in partnership with LA Compost. And they uh, maintain the Compost Hub. So I think it's about 75 members and you can sign up. And once you sign up, you're able to drop off your own compost scraps. Um, food waste is one of the largest uh, waste streams that we have. And we are, I think we are the only urban or, or in uh, city of Pasadena publicly accessible compost hub. There's also one at Westridge, but there's is private. We're just getting a lot of support in the comments about how people love the garden, like the labyrinth. Oh, yes. I Yes. The labyrinth. Um, I think the labyrinth was in partnership with Mayfield. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of the, the rooms in the garden are, again, like made, you know, they came from community support and they came from community involvement over the years. Oh, and it's our 15th anniversary this year. Mm -hmm. So the garden. And if people want to read more about the different rooms, uh, you can look at the blog right now. It's called Letters from the Garden, and it talks about, there's an interview with the designer, Maita, and she and Andrew talk about the different rooms and how it was designed and how it works all together. Uh, it was really fascinating. I didn't even know about it until I read the article. It was really good. Um, so yeah, thank you. I think that's all the questions. And then, you know, we're gonna be doing this every other week uh, throughout the summer. We're gonna have different people invited to come talk. Uh, oh, one last question. Are there plans to expand to the garden? Um, I think, I mean, I guess the expansion would be if we could get one of the adjacent Caltrans properties to do a Creative Urban Ecology Center. Um, yeah, so uh, this was in partnership with Nature for All, and they are actually having this really cool book club on Wednesdays called Wild LA Wednesdays. It's also bi-weekly. Um, and Arlington Garden is featured as a field trip in the book. And this Wednesday, two of the authors will be uh, participating for questions and answers and talking about um, the book and how they came about it. So that's going to be really interesting and everyone should check it out. And if you want more information, check out Nature for All and Arlington Garden. So thank you, everybody. Um, I wanted to, before we leave, um, just to reiterate the idea of the series, um, our Earth Share series is going to be every two weeks on Sunday. So that's, what's the date for the next one? The 31st of May. So May 31st will be our next uh, interview gathering Q&A um, here in our dining room. <laughs> um, we'll be doing a series of eight. This is the first. And next week we are interviewing. In two weeks. In <laughs> the next episode in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. We are interviewing Brenda Kyle. And she is a force of nature in herself. So that will be very interesting. And I hope everyone gets to tune in and ask questions. You want to talk a little um, bit more about who Brenda is? Brenda, oh my gosh, where to begin? <laughs> uh, she is um, in charge of the, of the volunteers at the Theodore Payne Foundation. She's a docent at Eaton Canyon. Uh, she's a steward for Nature for All. Um, Obama credited her for the San Gabriel National Monument. <laughs> she is everywhere and she's going to be a lot of fun. So a very interesting interview coming up because uh, Brenda will for sure have a lot to talk about. And hopefully uh, we'll have some people tuning in with lots of questions for her. So thanks everyone for tuning in. It means a lot to us. Thank you for having Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. This was wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> I don't know. Now we have to figure out how to end it. <laughs> uh-huh.